Hello, hello. How are you doing? My name is Adam Lovko and I like good music. David Ingber sitting to my left. You can call me right, but I'm always left. Anyway, hi. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, that means that David Ingber and I are in Lake Tahoe. Oh, yeah. Lake Tahoe is in Utah? It's Nevada in California. It's <laughs> kind of that, like, <laughs> it's that angle Should of Nevada. Should have asked you that before we went on the air. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be in Lake Tahoe. We're going to be at, uh, I believe it's like the biggest celebrity golf tournament in the world. Yeah, I can't believe that they can get this many big names into one, like wrangled into one location on it's one day. It's pretty incredible. It's kind of like bigger than the ESPYs in a way. I think it's the the tournament that when you see the video of like um, Aaron Rodgers throwing a pass to a guy on a boat and like Steph Curry, sh- I think it's that tournament. Oh, nice. So they hit me up a while to go and, and so we're going to try and get as many interviews as we can for the next few weeks. Uh, kind of have fun with it. Uh, but we wanted to record a podcast. We're doing this on Tuesday and we're going to do a little bit of uh, AMA, a little Ask Us Anything, and we're going to have interviews coming up in a little bit with Marcus Mariota and Sony Michelle. I have no idea if they're going to be good or not. Uh, they're brought to you by Gatorade. Uh, I'm recording this intro before we do them, but <laughs> I know they're going to be awesome. I'm I'm literally. I'm gonna make sure that they're fun. Are you gonna tell Mariota that he's the number one uh, ranking in your your stepdad rankings? Was it? I am now. <laughs> Thank you for that producing. That's good producing right now. I'll tell him that, and then I'll also kind of see. I'll tell him that I had him top ten in grill rankings. So yeah, I think I'm at him ten. That might get him talking more, but I just love just no context. Just be like, so we're on with the number one stepdad in the NFL, Marcus <laughs> Mariota. How's it going? And just hear what. The best part too is it's on the phone, so he's gonna be like. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh... <laughs> All right, so um, before we get into the Ask Me Anythings, I did see a, whoa, big offseason that I want to talk about really quick, and it was just Lane Johnson about Carson Wentz. I had to get some Eagles love in there. Said, Carson, he's really on a different mental state than he's ever been about to do some big things this season. I think this thus far this offseason, a lot of people have bought into the Mitchell Trubisky train, which we talked about on Tuesday's podcast, and right now... It's really unsettling to me that the Eagles are the media's team. Like, Mina Kimes came on this show. Uh, Lewis Riddick went online and said Carson Wentz is his pick for MVP. So you think it's flipped from the underrated to overrated thing? Like, hey, no one's talking about the Eagles. And then once 30,000 media members say no one's talking about the Eagles, clearly everyone's talking about it. My greatest fear right now is that Sports Illustrated is going to say, the Eagles are your Super Bowl champions. Like, that's my fear. Right. I don't think those teams ever win. Unless you pick the Patriots every year, and then you have a really good chance. But I am I'm very curious about this year of Carson Wentz. Um, I think the combination of being called out in the media by a few members of the Eagles, combined with signing a contract and thus protecting yourself, it's going to be a big year. Very well, excited. Can I jump in with one of the first AMA questions? Yeah, yeah, it's let's about get right to it. Uh, this is from at s black nineteen eighty four. He asks, besides the Eagles, who would you be quote okay with winning the Super Bowl? Let me pull up the teams. Let me pull up the teams. How about, let me, while I look this up, who are the teams? Do you root for any other team than the Patriots? Uh, no, I mean, the Patriots are my team. Um, do you but have I an do, NFC team? Like, some people do that. That's the thing. I I actually am a big Jimmy Garoppolo guy, right? They, he, How he could was, you not? Right. He was such a stud, uh, you know, like. For they, a few years, you in your mind went, he's the replacement. Right. And so, so grew, and uh, yeah. I spent like two and a half years thinking like, oh, this is the guy I'm going to root for for the next 15 years once Tom Brady decides to hang up his cleats. And that's that's going to be awesome. So I, I have that connection to him. A little Jacoby Brissett in that element, too, mm. right? That maybe Jacoby Brissett gets a team and I'll be rooting for him. So if I had an NFC team this year, it would be the 49ers. I don't think they're going to necessarily win the Super Bowl. But right. that's the team I got my eye on as like, hey, if they could sneak out nine and seven, I'll be rooting for them on Wild Card Weekend. Uh, I do love the 49ers. We've grown very close to that fan base over the last few years. Sure. And great fan base. Kittle just chugging beers after a Super Bowl title would be great. And I think the other team I'm cool with, and they're a, a favorite, is the Colts. There's just something about this Frank Reich, Andrew Luck team that with like Chris Ballard where everything is done with good intent. And I know this cannot be rubbing you the right way. <laughs> Like, I'm realizing it as I'm saying it. You're, you're, you're fine. Keep going. You're the rivalry between the – like, do you hate the, the Colts? Um, when it was Peyton Manning versus Brady and it felt like they were on Monday Night but Football But what about with the year. whole, like, 
in deflate gate. Like they're always the team that was, like the reporters came at the if, Patriots. If it was the sort of thing where that had led us down a down spiral and Brady and Belichick blew up and Seth Wickersham ended the dynasty right there, then yes, I would be bitter about that. But they yeah. went on to win another couple of Super Bowls. And, you know, know. like the, at a certain point, you're such a charmed sports fan that you, you just you drop lose. all the hate. Right. I get it. So if, I if, guess if, my reason is I would imagine luck on the parade similar to like Kawhi. Mm-hmm. We're like Kawhi did the oh uh-huh, oh uh-huh, and everyone laughed. I feel like Andrew Luck in a moment of joy, he would cry like he would quote like Jay. I don't know who's a really famous author. Fuck, a famous author, Chuck Klosterman, your guy. Damn it, I just wasn't ready. Uh, you uh, want to yeah, know a but, fun fact about Frank Reich? I would like to know a fun fact. Only quarterback in NFL history to be undefeated in the playoffs with more than one game. He's two and zero. He's two and zero in the playoffs in his life. Damn, isn't that cool? Love that guy. All right, I'm going to go to a question, uh, a response from the Instagram story. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. Um, all right, this is for both of us. Ethan M. Baxter, what is the largest animal you could beat in a fist fight? Hmm, largest animal I could beat in a fist fight. You know, there are some large ones that I wouldn't want to get into a fist fight with, but I probably could win. Right. Like, I think I could beat a dog. But, uh, that's what, no one wants to say they could beat a dog. But I'm going like, to say it right now. I'd really? punch it right in the face. Oh, my God. If so, this is blood sport, life or death. If that's the question. Like, if there's a cheetah coming at you and yeah. you have to survive. I don't think I could survive a cheetah. Oh, there's no chance. I mean, and I would also say that it depends on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever heard that thing? It's like, would you rather fight one horse-sized yes. duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? Yeah, I'm afraid of the massive amounts of them. Right. They're just grabbing it just, at your legs. I just go to that one Game of Thrones where like he's being swallowed up by, I don't want to feel that. Yes. I'm going right. to get claustrophobic and my ass kicked. So what's your answer? Is it a big ass, like Newfoundland dog? Um, I believe that the biggest animal that I could beat is your standard golden retriever. Yeah. It's also, it's interesting that they said fist fight because I don't know if the dog is adhering to the rules of a fist fight. Yeah. Can they not bite me? I think the dog is going after your jugular in the way that dogs do. That's like in their DNA, right? I'm going for that jugular too. <laughs> well, that's not a fist fight, my friend. You're in a bite fight Yeah, it's now. not a fun thing to say out loud when you realize it. <laughs> what, you, you're now on microphone willfully talking about beating up a dog. If the dog was attacking me. If the dog were attacking you. It's yes. in self-defense. That's fine. What was yours? Uh, the animal that I could beat up. <laughs> You know, I do have, like, my my friends, if they're ever listening to this, are going to, like, die laughing because I have this, like, infamous history where I, like, fought off a group of pigeons. Really? At one point, like, they were just circling around my air conditioner right outside my bedroom window and just, (laughs) till three, four, five in the morning. Taunting you. And I know it sounds stupid and funny, but, like, week three where you can't sleep. It's not funny anymore. No. You're a psychotic New Yorker at that point. And I, I had to do anything possible. So I uh, actually got some NyQuil and I spread it on some wheat thins and fed it Bro. On, on the on, on the windowsill. We have both implicated ourselves a lot. <laughs> what happened? They did not come back. I don't know if they are deceased, but they did not come back. Wow. I had a, an ish, uh, situation at the beach where I was like holding a sandwich and this seagull came down and tried to rip it from my hand and I pulled it back and like he stared at me and I almost fought the seagull at the beach. Oh my God. It's terrifying. Yeah. Okay, so uh, no interest you, in fighting animals. You just learned a lot much. about us right there. All right, what's next from the Twitter verse? Uh, this is a football one, not not so much a silly one. Yeah. But, uh, at Kevin Lapko one one two says, realistically, who has the brighter future going forwards, Trubisky or Deshaun Watson? Uh, Watson. Hmm. I think that um, I like Nagy more than Bill O'Brien, but I believe that Deshaun Watson is a a player that can win a Super Bowl. On his own, like he's one of those special players that can make magic happen. He can go on like a Russell Wilson type run and just win three playoff games on his back. And Trubisky is someone that I think is a little bit more uh, offense dependent. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting, um, uh, defensive end pass rusher for the Bengals, I think it was Carl Lawson, said that he thinks it's actually easier to sack Aaron Rodgers than anybody else. And I read the full quote. And in the quote, he said that uh, it's because Aaron Rodgers is going to wait for that guy to get open because he knows that la- and he's going to pat the ball. He goes, now, we were up by two and a half touchdowns on Aaron Rodgers. And he came back and beat us, but I got two and a half sacks. Mm-hmm. He said it's harder to sack a guy like Trubisky because the offensive coordinator protects him. 
That's where we still are with Trubisky. Sure. We've never had that with Deshaun Watson. But are they going to take off the restrictor plate at some point? Like when we find out he's this whole different quarterback we weren't expecting. I believe that when you are the superstar talent, Mm. the restrictor plate never goes on. It comes on later in your career. Later in our career, we go to Andrew Luck and say, stop running so fucking much. (laughs) Later in the career, we go to Carson Wentz and say, start protecting your body. Deshaun Watson got sacked last year more than any quarterback in the NFL. They're not protecting him at all. He's doing whatever he needs to do. They're giving him room to improvise, though. Mitchell Trubisky has been, much like Jared Goff, put into a certain path, and he's executed very well in that path. I believe it's harder to get a Trubisky to do a Watson than it is for Watson to do a Trubisky, if that makes sense. Uh, I would love to hear your, your, your buddy Warren Sharp's take on all of this, because when you see numbers of sacks at the end of the year, and it's like, oh, Aaron Rodgers got sacked 24 times, and this guy got sacked 18, and that means this, yes. that, and the other. But I'd love to hear Warren, Sharp, Warren Sharp's sort of breakdown of, like, was it a system sack? Yes. And that, like, because Aaron Rodgers got sla- sacked slightly more, he actually was able to throw this many more yes. yards, you know? Pro Football Focus actually does a good job of charting like what are sacks or what are coverage sacks or right. quarterback sacks and they'll put sacks on the quarterback if it's on them but anytime you see a team like the Houston Texans reach on an offensive tackle in the first round because one just got taken and then reach again in the second round on another offensive tackle that's really all you need to know about where they thought those sacks were coming from right their offensive line they traded Dwayne Brown to the Seahawks two seasons ago because he was saying all those comments about the owner R.I.P. Uh, and they just they haven't been able to figure it out. Right. But and Bill O'Brien still wants to run the same Patriots offense without Dante Scarnecki. It's just <laughs> not going to work. All right. Uh, I.G. One. Um, if you were to rob a bank. Yeah. Oh, I love heist stuff. Yes. Which member of the heist squad would you be? So do your typical Ingber inventory. What right. are the members of a heist squad? Uh, you've definitely got the wheel man. Right, driver. Uh, yeah, you've got the uh, the grease man, according to Ocean's Eleven, the guy that can sneak into small places. Oh, right, that's very valuable. You know uh, all the names. <laughs> you've got the uh, the Danny Ocean, who's just sort of putting it all together. Yep, yep. Um, you know who I would be though is the guy that is unflappably able to talk to people without you know without giving anything away. I've got a, sort of an acting improv. Background. So you're the distractor. Yeah, well, it's just it's the guy that can that can just walk right in and talk to the bank manager and be like, "Hey, I'd like to talk to you about uh, you know, I got to talk, take a look at your vault. You know, I'm 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 buying uh, my wife some nice jewelry for her birthday, and I, oh. I have to take a look at the. I need to see. Some so you down. open the vault with your mouth. Yeah, I'm just I'm just nice. the chit chat guy. I would be the slightly out of shape, fake heart attack distract guy. Oh yeah, that's Saul. Uh, Saul <laughs> Rosen. Oh God! <laughs> oh, something's <laughs> wrong with my arteries. You got to be another 30, 40 years old. Because I'm that. not slipping into anything. If you talk to my family and friends, you don't want me behind the wheel. Oh, okay. Um, You're not my wheel man. No, I could also be a really good. Everybody get on the ground. Like I could hit that. Okay. Really well. That's a different kind Apologies of. Apologies to all the listeners. That's a different kind of bank robbery. That's more of the town than Ocean's Eleven. That shows how much more prepared you are. Because I was. I wasn't do it prepared for this course. question at all. But at any moment, I am prepared to discuss heists at a very high. We level. We have not looked at any of these questions. <laughs> no, we haven't. But I will bust out. You know what you need to. Yeah, see, Yeah, I by was the way. thinking the town. Oh, you were thinking Ocean's Eleven. La Casa del Papel, the Spanish uh, language. Uh, series that's on Netflix. They, they call paper it House. The, the yeah, House well, of paper? they called it Money Heist when they translated it into English for some reason. It's a 22 episode heist. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't think that it's able to sustain itself wow. as a series. It's incredible. Highly recommended. All right. Uh, heist, heist knowledge. Subtitles? Pop culture. Yeah, I watch it with I'm subtitles. In. I pay more attention to subtitles. Don't watch it with the English dubbing because it's very distracting oh, the whole oh, time. Yeah. The acting is so good in Spanish. All right, to Twitter we go. All right. At Harvey 100, uh, Mary Fuck Kill, Kirk Cousins, Eli Manning, Blake Bortles. These are so weird. <laughs> you can just marry all of them if you want. You can um, be friends with all of them, whatever you want to do. Kirk Cousins, Eli, Blake. Blake's gone. He's just uh, sorry. Damn. No, I'm going to take that back. You don't want to do it? No, I think I'm going to marry Kirk. Oh, great. Yeah. yeah you're going to teach him how to grill. And I think I'm going to kill Eli. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here first. Damn, that's such a... I don't like that quite. It's weird. That's fair. Um, uh, all right. Would you ever have... This is from Luca Olius. Mm-hmm. Would you ever have one of the 33% homies on the show? Uh, yes. And I will also make a formal announcement. We are going to do the Left Go Show Fantasy League again this year. And that's think, one of the questions. Great. I think that was another question, too. Uh, so uh, whether this is Meatball Henry uh, or, or... Excuse me. 
Meatloaf Henry or anybody else that wants to organize this again. We had nearly 400 people sign up last year. I think it was a lot of fun. Remember, we had one of the homie 33% who won the league come on to the show and do five to 10 minutes. And I think also as we do more shows on the road, as those are kind of popping up, we're going to do some live AMAs and stuff. So you guys will be able to come on the show. But I think, uh, yeah, my, my main thing is the guy that wins the Fantasy League is definitely coming on. When we hit on the road, you guys can come on. And then maybe if you guys want to send me some questions that you think are really funny, whether it's video of it, uh, maybe it's in the Lefko Show DMs on Instagram. Because that way I can just kind of get them. Maybe we'll play some on the show. And we're just going to make that on the fly right there. You just produced the show. Thank you. Perfect. Lewis. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, we got two questions that are on the same theme now. Okay. Okay. This is at Angelo Fermato asks the NFL QB rankings for most likely to survive on a desert island. And then uh, at Liam Owen 30 says, if you had to survive on an island with one NFL player, who would it be? So it's kind of a similar theme there. So the first one, I think I kind of answered that. That one, I feel very similar, the rankings to the... Um, what was that movie that we did a thing on? Oh, the Hunger Games. Hunger Games. Yeah. So for me, it's like the Carson Wentz. It's like Carson Wentz because I think he's going to help me survive. Yep. And he's such a giving guy. I mean, he literally has a food truck that serves the homeless. In that situation, that would be me. So That's I, really nice. I would need him to feed me. But what if we go non-QBs? Just anyone in the NFL is now fair game. I'm assuming coaches are fair game. I'm assuming broadcasters are fair game. Who would you, who would help you survive on a desert island? So I think that there's two questions. There's one, who's going to help me survive? And there's two, who would you want to hang out with for an unlimited amount of time with no other distractions? If I found out that fish and coconuts and water were easy to come by, and now it's just a, a matter yeah, of like, yeah, who yeah. do you want to hang out in the teepee with, yeah. I would love to kick it with Kelsey. Uh, I would love to kick it with Kittle. I think tight ends, I, I believe, might have the best personality because they're reasonable like offensive linemen. Uh, but at the same point, they're a little bit flashy like a wide receiver. Okay. And Get so they the have that. Yeah, they have a nice little mix. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to annoy most of these people. That's really the issue, too. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, I'm also trying to figure out who kind of likes me already and would tolerate me. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. How about you? I think I'd want to hang with McVeigh, Sean McVeigh. He just seems like a cool hang. Just He's keep a young guy. Asking him questions. I, yeah, and that's the thing. Like he would be, like he would memorize the layout of the island on the first few hours, and yeah. then he'd he'd know which berries you could eat. He would just he would have he this would mental catalog. He would never forget where something was. That's what I'm that's saying. That's great. Yeah. Where was that palm tree with those delectable coconuts? That's a value add. Right Seventeen there. paces to the left. <laughs> yes. Um. Okay, man, a lot of F Mary kills. That's a yeah, it's a it's an it's a standard trope of AMAs. Who would win in a sumo fight, Quinton Nelson or Trent Brown? Oof. I am going to go Quinton Nelson because I believe in sumo, a lot of it is leverage. Yes. And I believe that the height that Trent Brown has will actually be a distraction and that Quinton will be able to get underneath him and toss him out of bounds. Yeah, I don't think uh, I, I imagine some. He does have of longer height, arms. I do imagine some amount of height is helpful in sumo, and then at a certain point it flips where you don't want that much height anymore, and you're you're actually someone's able to yes. get up under you, which is true of offensive linemen in a way sometimes. I think, and everybody knows I love Trent Brown, but Quinton Nelson. Uh, Trent Brown has a lot of weight. Quinton Nelson is compact, and he's like a fire hydrant, mm. and. When when people that I know have been around Trent Brown, they go, isn't he big? When I know other football players that have been around Quentin Nelson, they go, I've never seen anyone built like that. Where it's like the traps and the pec muscles. It's He's he's not as like cut as Aaron Donald, but it's like very well-placed 300 pounds mm. or even more. I'm taking Quentin Nelson. Yeah, I think I would go with Quentin Nelson too. Um, you want another question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is from at G Mills four. Do you understand basic economics? I don't know if that's a dig or if it's just a question he's interested in. Oh, that is probably a response to my NBA NFL rant. I don't know if that's a question. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thing about the whole NBA NFL rant was, as a, if you listen to the actual podcast, I am not saying that NFL players should be paid as much as NBA players. I was just spotlighting the disparity between how much money they make on a yearly basis. Yeah, sometimes there's there's a difference between saying there needs to be a systemic change versus just I'm just laying out facts because they're interesting. Oh, I'm doing. And I think you were much more the latter in that. Uh, it's, it's really interesting what I've learned uh, 
working in the sports opinion space is that everyone knows, um, I, I call it the irrefutable evidence fandom thing. That's not what I call it. It When you're watching a football game and there's a fucking replay yeah. and your friend looks at you and goes, the call on the field was incomplete and they need, excuse me, indisputable video evidence right. to overturn it. You look at your friend and go, a no shit. I've watched football before and I've heard Troy Aikman say that a thousand times. Yeah. Chris Collinsworth is all about they need indisputable evidence. It's like, yes, we know. We've and, seen this And before. when someone says that, I go, it's implied. I understand that, but it's good that you can, as a human, hear something and then re-say it at a later date. Mm -hmm. There are certain debates that people find a little bit of information on, and they're obsessed with letting you know that they have that information. Mm. There's more people on an NFL roster. A no shit. Is that true? They though? play more <laughs> games than the NBA. A no shit. Right. And, but what happens is they go, I know a fact. And you go, obviously. I know that fact too, but thank you for presenting that fact. Right. So, so uh, ever since that video came out, it's been very fun to hear all the facts that everybody knows. It's really great. <laughs> but the I call it the indisputable video evidence. While while we're on the topic of indisputable evidence, yeah, I just feel ones? like well, just just the idea that when there is a a call that needs to be overturned, it's either indisputable or it's not. And if you have to watch five minutes worth of re replay, it's clearly disputable. Right. Great point. Re regardless of whether the like a quarter of a blade of grass touched the ball under the guy's hand, like if you couldn't see that until it was in super duper crazy slow mo yeah. on the 18th replay, like then Julian it Edelman on that punt where they thought it might have hit his thumb and they watched it like for 10 yeah. minutes. I feel like since if, if you're going to call it indisputable evidence is required, then you should be able to watch it twice at pretty much regular speed and everyone at home goes, oh, yeah, yeah, he stepped out of bounds or oh, yeah, yeah, the ball hit the ground. Cool. Like, because we see those replays oh, on TV man. and we're like, yeah, done. Why are, we wa why are we still watching this? I have not spent any time on this because I know that we're going to be spending a lot of time on this during the season. But when there's like less than two minutes left and they're looking to see how much hand went on from a cornerback to a wide receiver and they're deciding what's pass interference, it's going to be awful. Yeah. I'm not, I don't even want to talk about it right now because the to me it's what we did in the preseason last year talking about the uh, leading with the head hits and how that took over the news cycle. Sure. That's happening this year. Mm -hmm. those, those weeks one through three of the preseason, it's going to be awful. Former lawyers are going to have a field day on TV talking about that kind of shit. Um, I just got one. I'm stealing one of yours from Twitter. Please. It just says, more details on your new show. Ah. I don't know what we're allowed to divulge at this stage. You can yeah. say whatever you want. Well, I mean, I just don't, I don't want to, like, ditch the playbook right now and, like, kind of get everything out there. Um, I will say what the new show is going to be. Uh, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be like eight episodes during the season. Yes. And they're going to be YouTube episodes. If you watch The Sims and Lefko, the show last year, it was kind of like a studio show where we did a bunch of different segments. This one, every episode is going to be about a different player. Yes. And we're going to be doing things in the field with these players that are very fun. All of them are related to football, but deeper dives that you haven't really seen before. I don't want to give away any of the episodes. We're going to be shooting a lot, but it's sort of like, man, if the Lefko show is me interviewing Quentin Nelson, this YouTube show will be me doing things with Quentin Nelson. Yeah. That's, I think, the most I want to get into it before, without giving away things. It's that classic show, don't tell type yeah. of show. And that, that's what it's literally going to be. Yeah. Showing, not telling. Uh, at Talkin' TDs, he asks, um, out of all your guests since becoming the Lefko Show, who would win the Royal Rumble? Because you've had some tough dudes on this show. So this is just becoming the Lefko Show. This is not including Sims and Lefko. Right. The, the name that popped into my mind, I don't know if you got, if you want to say yours first, but Let I, me hear yours. I think Kelechi is, uh, is a tough out in a Royal Rumble. I think Kelechi would take down Trent Brown. And those are really like two, like I think Jonathan Abram would fight until he, like, but he's he's like more in the like Iceman Dean Malenko uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> wrestling yeah. category. Like, uh, you know, Kalechi, he's the Undertaker. If he turned it on, I don't think a lot of people are getting in his way. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, maybe Warren Sharp. You think? 
Well, because what if Warren Sharp is like <laughs> secretly like a triple black belt and knows all of like the instant dead points? That was the thing in in the sequel to the Hunger Games, right? Where it was all these former champions, and two of them were these very bookish nerds that yeah. didn't have any fighting skills, but they could like wire up some weird electricity and beat the other people that, that way. Might be Warren. Maybe that's Warren Sharp's. Emma. Kalechi's like you're mine, and then like takes a step and then explodes <laughs> like Super Smash Brothers. And Warren, and Warren Sharp's wearing some weird jet propulsion pack that allows him to fly around. Uh, that you didn't see that wire there. I figured you'd would with a great awareness. Yeah, I'd probably go Kalechi too. Um, if you have, everybody wants me to fight or have sex with people. <laughs> Next time we ask for AMAs, uh, this is so stay away weird. from the fighting and sex, I guess. Um, PP Shumpter, Shumpeter, are you still in contact with Sims? How do you cope with the loss? Will he see him on? Uh, me and Sims text uh, somewhat regularly. I think uh, the truth for most people that you'll learn is when you're in high school and you go to college, you don't talk to many of your high school friends because you're busy all the time with college. Mm -hmm. When you go from college to professional, same thing. Uh, we, we text every now and then. If something from his show that I like pops into my timeline, I'll hit him up and be like, oh, nice job. Yeah. Or if I got an interview, then he sees it that. Um, I was wishing his brother a happy birthday. Um, you know, we're, We go back and forth. He just got a new house, so I was congratulating him on that. How do I cope with it? Uh, if I was going to let you guys behind the curtain, I was able to cope with it all throughout December and January because that's kind of when I knew it was going to happen was in December. So like I was dealing with the realization in December and January. So by the time I was ready to kind of do the Lefko show, I had gotten a lot of it out of my system because mm. it sucks. Because the thing that I always tell people, it's not that I was like, oh, it's more work or oh, I want to keep talking to Sims. It's more like I got to see my guys every day. And, you know, like, it's fun to hang out with you every day. It's fun. It was fun to hang out with Sims. You know what I mean? Like, sure. you just, they're, they're your friends. So um, for me, the thing that I really tried to do was sit down a lot and go, what do I want the show to be? Not how do I keep this thing running, but what do, if I was going to make this more myself, where would I want it to go? And so being able to kind of sit down and, and try and come up with ideas and, and a direction that allows you to cope with anything because mm -hmm. then you get into the creative process and you're like, let's keep doing that shit. And to be honest, the homies and the 33% rallying the way they did, making me feel like a goddamn king all the time and, and reaching out to you guys and saying, who do you want on this guest and being able to get the fantasy footballers and Kyle Brand, Nate Burleson, Amina Kimes. And like, yeah, we're running down that list. Being quickly, able to great. like deliver that shit is very rewarding. Yeah. Cause even for me, I'm like, you like I'll hit up people and they're like, I would be honored. I'm like, you're honored. I thought I was reaching out and wasn't going to get a response. People like being asked to do stuff. I'm, yeah. I am continually impressed when you reach out to like NFL players or other media members and you're like, Hey, would you do this podcast? And they're like, hell yeah. yeah. Like, oh yeah. People like to be asked to do stuff. It's, it's nice. weird too. Like when people come in, they're like, man, I've really been enjoying your shit. I'm like, you watch my shit. God, pay attention to things that matter. <laughs> and I just like to add, I continue to text Chris Sims as much as I did before I got this job, Yeah, which is never, but that <laughs> We are at the same level that we've always been at. Uh, you want this one from at Mr. Rogers Story. Ooh. If you could choose any city to get a new NFL franchise, where would it be? And what would the team name be? Let me pull up the cities. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, like what city, what's what's a what's a nice juicy city that deserves an NFL team that would be great for road trips, that would be a great fan base built in. Like I just I think Vancouver. So here is a bleach interesting. That's interesting. I mean, like, who doesn't want another Pacific Northwest team? So I looked up Bleacher Report, of course, has a list of the 10 cities that are the biggest that do not have an NFL team. Uh, and number one was Los Angeles. So this is clearly a little bit dated. <laughs> but the options, <laughs> have two. San Antonio, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada was three. So they're getting one. Columbus, Ohio, Orlando, Omaha, Nebraska, Dude, Sacramento. Dude, give me an Omaha team. That's a great idea. Portland, Oregon, Norfolk, Virginia, Salt Lake City, Utah. I think which one? Omaha is interesting. Just because the Nebraskans, they're obsessed they with They would football. go nuts. Yeah. I love your idea of Vancouver. I think Toronto has opened up a lot of eyes mm -hmm. with the NBA title. I also think about teams like Mexico City. 
Yeah, that's that. The international stuff is really. And cool. And then everyone always talks: Is London going to get a team? I mean, I love the idea of Vancouver, just because a lot of people in like Seattle, Portland, whatever, can take a nice, cool road trip yeah. over to Vancouver and see a, a you know if your if your team's in town yeah. for the weekend. Mexico City, I feel like is a is a more of a commitment if you're you know, have to fly there from somewhere else. But yeah, if if they have enough NFL fans down there to sustain the team, that's cool. I say go international. I'm going to pick Oakland. Oakland. Yeah. Yeah. Because their team's going to Vegas. So you want to replace it. Yeah, I think they should. It's like Seattle getting an NBA team back at some point. Oh, man. The, the NFL would never do that. Just like the NBA will never do no, that. No, but I'm saying like there's that, of course. that pang of nostalgia. Yes. That, like, you know, certain people that just want, you know, Seattle got robbed of its amazing Sonics. And that that's a franchise city that deserves an NBA team. And maybe one day, knock on wood, we'll get one. I think St. Louis can have an NFL team again, too. Sure. I know th- those were, I mean, shoot. It's fun. it's interesting that you mentioned St. Louis because they this question also asked what would you name the team mm. and there was an NBA team or maybe an ABA team but there was an NBA team for a while a basketball team that was named the Spirit of St. Louis it was like the team name came before the city which wow. has never happened before it wasn't like the New York Knicks it was the Spirit of St. Louis which I just think is so cool yeah as a, as a team name uh, j- j- it's so hard to come up with a truly innovative cool team name if anyone's gonna come up with cool team names it's you it's not me. So anyway, the Spirit so if you of were St. Going, Louis. if you were going to Vancouver, what would the team name be? Oh, boy, that's such a great question. Uh, so they got the Canucks, they had the Grizzlies for a while, and then it became the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, I'd need to, I'd want to learn more. I'd want to, I'd want to spend an hour The really... Vancouver Cougars. Sure. No, that's they... awful. <laughs> I'd, I, I really... What would the London team name be? Because this is something that people talk about at the time. If London got a football team, yeah. what would they be called? The Guard, the Palace Guard. The London Guard is a phenomenal fucking name. Wouldn't that be cool? I love team names that don't have an S at the end. Oh, yeah. It's the trivia question we've all answered. It's the heat. It's the magic. If it's the London Guard, fuck. And then think about, like, all the cool posters and T-shirts you could have if they have a sick defense. What if it was the London Eye? The Eye's good, too. And then it's like a... like a sort Always of, watching you. It's like one of the... It, but it's the look... It's the helmet is the eye from Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. So it's like that burning, fiery orange eye. It's the Sauron. The London Guard is really good. It's not bad. I just... I, that, by the way, is not old material. I just That's thought of That's one of Ingber's strengths is <laughs> thinking of names on the spot. Because you think the word London, you start rattling off, okay, like Tower of London, Buckingham Palace, da 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 So I just went to Buckingham Palace Guard and I thought, hey... You know, like, they kind of have the color scheme of the Buckingham Palace Guard. The red and black would look sick. Yeah. Oh, my God. It would be We really got cool. something. Um, if you could be the brother of one NFL coach, I love who this. would it be? This is Tanner Mallon. <laughs> the brother of a coach. And you have to think, who's going to give me the best benefit? If you're Belichick's brother, he's not bringing you into the facility unless he's working you to the bone. Right. You kind of need to find the cool guy. Now, if you're a brother of John and Jay, now you're the third Gruden brother, and you're the only one not coaching. Awkward Thanksgiving. What about, yeah, Harbaugh, Ryan brothers? You join a brother group already, you're the Cooper Manning. And now right. you're the one that's not following the path. Understood. I would love to be Mike Tomlin's brother. Mm. In multiple ways, but I just think he'd be a guy that would kind of let you coach the wide receivers for a day, <laughs> which I feel like would be a blast. Um, I would be Andy Reid's brother, just because I would love every like every photo opportunity we get, we wear the same Hawaiian shirt, and then that becomes our shtick, <laughs> <laughs> right? We're just we're always wearing silly, bright, crazy luau shirts, and it's like I love oh. That. Dave and Andy uh, Reid always always wearing their shirts at the luau. I love that one a lot. Uh, Zimmer is too intense uh, to be my brother. Patricia would blame me for things. I would love to be Sean Payton's brother, too. Oh, definitely. Because I just Good see hang. Sean Payton getting done with practice, lighting up a stogie, passing you one, pouring you a little glass of bourbon and being like, wide receivers, right? And you're like, <laughs> fuck them. I just, I, Sean Payton would be a great hang. Did you mention Vrabel? Vrabel's still a little too intense. I would rather, I'm would i more of the Sean Payton, Bruce Arians than the Vrabel, Brian Flores. No, but I think v- uh, Vrabel has that like real intense during the game and super chill before and after. I think I think you don't get feel. Oh, it's all running wind sprints before games. Yeah, dude, dude, staying in shape. Yeah, that's tight. I, mean. I don't like guys that stay in shape. <laughs> Bruce Arians, Bruce Arians, literally is like if your if your wife 
has a recital that she needs to go to, then you leave work and you go to it. Hmm. Like Bruce Arians cares a lot about family. So that's why I feel like maybe he might be the best. Brother. We should point out that if you and I were NFL coaches, we would still put in like 40 hour weeks. We wouldn't we wouldn't be doing the like 120 hour weeks that people are like it was like, hey, wait, how did you name me the NFL coach? You knew what you were getting into. Did you break down second down from the 15 yard line? I uh, no. I figured one of my assistants would do that. I got how this guy this Warren Sharp looking up some stuff. <laughs> that's the thing. You could hire your guys. I would try to because I'm not doing it all. You got another one over there? Uh, yeah, Dream Guests from at Pay and I don't know how to pronounce it, at Panger? Dream Guests. Let's go up and back here. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is my number one. Numero uno. But my, my issue is, I've said this before, if I got Aaron on, I wouldn't even know where to start. I feel like every podcast has a thing like that. Like, I, I listened to a lot of Chris Hardwick podcasts back in the day, and he talked about how Steve Martin was his number one comedy idol, but that if he ever got him on, he would just kind of freeze up and like, yeah. I don't, where do I even start? Because like, you just want to go, what's it like to be amazing? <laughs> yeah. You know? And just do that for an hour. Do the Chris Farley show. Exactly. Remember when you threw that Hail Mary? That was awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, so Aaron Rodgers, what about like if they walked in, would you text your wife and go, holy shit, this person's in here today? doesn't have to be football related. Uh, Could also be Tom Brady. Yeah, I mean, Tom Brady. I, I feel like I've heard every interview Tom Brady's done, uh, except yeah. I missed that beer chugging one, which I still blame my friends for not having seen yeah. that one until the, it was too late. Um, I just like, I think... I mean, you had Julian Edelman in here. I'm just running through, like, great Patriots because yeah. th those are the people. Belichick is in my top five. Yeah, Belichick would be in Mainly there. Mainly because. You, with, if you wouldn't get him to open up, that's amazing. But but here's the deal. If you get, if Rodgers or Belichick ever came on the pod, that means that they had to have okayed it mm. because Rodgers typically doesn't do sports podcasts and Belichick never does any media. I saw him do one video one time with like an MSNBC and it was because it was all about the Navy and he was like, he'll do Navy or lacrosse. But if he was willing to sit down with me, that means that he's willing to go down that road. Mm -hmm. But to me, it would be the most fun to try and read him and to try and figure out where he would want to go. And the, there are just not a lot of humans that are that challenging. And the good thing, too, is like if Belichick doesn't answer my questions and walks out, that's what he does to everybody. Right. I'm just one of everybody then. Yeah. So I'm trying to think through it in terms of like who would have the coolest stories? Mm. Who have I not heard enough from? Mm. Right. Because like I said, with Brady, Brady's done a lot of interviews. He's did the entire Facebook series. He did. There really isn't anything we don't know about him at this point. So uh, even though he's to me the GOAT, he's my favorite patriot of all time, this, that and the other. Yeah. Uh, I would go with someone like Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson is a podcast guest. You sit him down. He must just have story upon story. Everyone knows him. Everyone looks up to him. Yeah. He's one of the great what-if athletes of our lifetime. Deion Sanders is up there for me, too. Sure. You talk about, like, storytellers and oh, stuff yeah. like that. I would love to get old classic teammates together. Mm, that's like, I would love to get a Dion and Michael together. I would love to get a Steve Young, Joe Montana together. And that would be kind of awkward, but like yeah. that whole thing would be like such a cool dynamic. I would love to get Jerry Jones. The, the, the thing though is that I'm, when I'm thinking about it, the thing that sucks about when you interview a guy like Jerry Jones is there's these questions that as a media guy, you think you have to ask. Mm -hmm. And all I want to talk to Jerry Jones about is partying. Like, that's what I would just want to be like, man, what's it like to be, make your money on oil? You know, like yeah. that has to be fucking crazy. You're just like, drill over there. Oh, shit. Like that, <laughs> that's another like, billion. What was that first day like when you tapped oil? You know, but everyone would be like talking about the code of conduct. And, and I just don't want to talk about that. Shit. See, what I thought you were going to say is that when you interview someone like Roger Goodell or Jerry Jones or someone that's at that level, like even if you were to interview Barack Obama, it would be so sanctioned, the questions that you'd be able to ask that you'd probably have to send. Thousand their, percent. Right. And so and it's I like, want to surprise these guys. Yeah. So if you're saying dream podcast guest, it's a matter of who could you get, but then who could you also do the interview with that you want to do? I would do an entire interview with Barack Obama about the Chicago Bears. Like, I think that I would love to reduce these, like, super powerful people to just fans. Oh, that's great. And only talk about their fandom. I'm just saying it out there for, oh, for people that have, like, never run a podcast before. That if you're like, oh, how is this person your, your, your dream guest? Just think about your true dream guest and how hard it is to book that person. And then all the levels of security that go involved in that. And you don't actually have that 
open, free-flowing conversation. Guys, we we've had have. guests on here recently, and I was told I can't ask them certain things. Right. And they're not fucking Barack Obama or Roger Goodell. There you go. I mean, Obama at this point, he's just so like, I'm the former president. I'm I'm in my He writes a book and needs phase. to go on a tour and we get him for like... <laughs> sure. <laughs> That would I'm, be amazing. I'm sure he would love to talk uh, talk, talk football and not talk politics for a minute. You know, like some of the some of the guys here at Bleacher Report that focus on soccer, yeah. they love talking to American athletes who also love soccer, the Steve Nashes, sure. the J.J. Watts of the world, because they're so amped up to talk about oh. their like their secret passion they never get asked about. Talking to Obama about Jim McMahon, like, get out of here. That would be incredible. Right. I would love to interview Mark Davis. Mm. I am a slightly fascinated by the sons of... Of franchise owners. Right. Or people that didn't make the money themselves and dealing with that. Mm -hmm. Now, I wouldn't explicitly say it to him like that, but like Mark Davis, James Dolan, like all these guys, Jim Ursay is someone I would love to interview and he just talk like to him a, about these guitars that he's buying. He seems like he wouldn't, like, he he wouldn't ask for the questions in advance. He'd be like, all right, we're doing this. Where do I sit? All right, let's yeah. do this. Let me I, fire away. The Pat McAfee stories where he talks about Ursay, he's like, hey, man, I just, I got this, this Beatles guitar, man. Like, <laughs> it just, I would love that. Uh, all right, let us go to the IG. Uh, this is actually just a compliment the true Chabo, just saying the 33% is also in Denmark. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, I also ask if you could host any TV show you want for one show, what would it be? It's easy. Is it? Saturday Night Live. Wow. You get to be an SNL host. You get to do the monologue. You get I to be in a couple sketches. That. I was going to answer like Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to host Jeopardy for an episode. Don't get me wrong. Jeopardy's a lot. I just feel like Wheel of Fortune, I'd be like, oh, bankrupt. See, that's the difference between us. I'm a Wheel of, and I don't even watch Wheel of Fortune. I mean, you you should do at some point in your life. You should do Family Feud. Oh, because you my walking dream. over to the families with the long microphone, be like, "Now nah, oh. tell me, this All is right. Aunt Karen here. Aunt Karen, tell me, what do you do for a living?" Is that your Steve Harvey? For a little bit? <laughs> no, that was I was kind of doing a little Dawson, <laughs> you know, the Len, uh, Richard Dawson. Uh, that would be amazing. Um, and uh, I'd like to be the main host of Good Morning Football. Ah. Just make fun of them the entire time. No, I'm just kidding. I love all those people. No, I yeah, I think SNL is the correct answer. Yeah. Good answer. Oh, Good wow. answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's like Family Feud. Put it on the board. Yes. We asked 100 people what show they'd like to host. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got one more here. Okay. At Aiden 94047878, if you ever wrote down that handle, good for you. Mm. Which QB gets the least recognition for consistently being great in the league? That's a hard one, right? So who who teeters on consistently really good but doesn't get the attention? Russell Wilson was that guy for a long time. But now he's... Now I think uh, it's he needed to have all those other pieces pulled away from him for people to go, wow, he can still do this. But mm -hmm. for a long time, him and Aaron Rodgers were the ones overcoming their own offenses and dealing with no planning and having to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anyone that kind of comes? I think Big Ben is a guy that's taken for granted a lot. Interesting. Uh, and we're going to see a big test with him this year without Antonio Brown. Um, there were, I feel like there were some stories last year of like, hey, Drew Brees has been doing this for 19 years. Where's his love? You know, I think he gets too much love. And it's like he gets a ton of love. Yeah. So it, it is, it's one of those weird, you know, snake eating its own tail type Stafford of is that guy for me too. Oh, because he's awesome. Stafford's one of those guys that when you talk to actual NFL players, they go, man, I love Matt Stafford. Yeah. When you talk to fans that want to talk about records or comebacks and all that stuff, they're not a fan. But... The true thing about Matt Stafford is the offensive line's been a mess. Uh, he got punished publicly by having Megatron because everyone's like, how are you not going to win with Megatron? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't know, maybe like the coach, none of the coaches have been good ever. Like who's the, been the best offensive coordinator on that team? Jim Bob Cooter? Like that's not even a joke. His name's funny, but that's no, really I, his best OC. I'm well aware. <laughs> but it's... Yeah, I think Stafford is definitely up there, too. I think Matt Ryan was there for a little bit, too. Yeah, it's like once you win an MVP and you make a Super Bowl, it's a little tough. Like every, Because you just think of that Super Bowl week when literally everyone's talking about you. So it's it's hard to really fly under the radar. Phil Rivers never made a Super Bowl. Maybe that's something you could talk about. It's incredible. Phil Rivers, I mean, unbelievable career numbers. Truly unbelievable career numbers. And he's won like a total of five playoff games. 
you know? So is that like an underachieving career or is he still an awesome quarterback that just happened to get bad luck at the wrong times? Like, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I know. Cause it's like, what do you do with like the Schottenheimer years? And then some of the other coaches, they haven't had success elsewhere. Uh, we're going to get to Mariota and Sony Michelle in a second. Uh, but I want to do this one. Simp 21. Who is your Mount Rushmore? Hmm. One athlete, one actor or actress, one musician, and one miscellaneous. Oh, my God. What a fantastic question. So my athlete is Brian Dawkins. Do you have your athlete figured out? Michael Jordan. I'm not going to overthink this one. That's your favorite athlete. He's the number one. If I'm making a Mount Rushmore it's or your my Mount, Mount Rushmore. Rushmore. Your Mount Rushmore. Everything is subjective. There is right. no... Yeah, so it would have to be Nomar Garcia Para then. Say it in the accent. Nomar Garcia Para. Thank you. He was my number one athlete. You know, everyone has their athlete when they were like 12, 13 years old, when they come into the league and they're your guy. You know, Nomar was my guy. My guy. Dude hit 370, <laughs> always swinging on the first pitch, hitting 78 doubles off the wall. You are someone that has done acting. Who is the actor or actress that you're going to put on your Mount Rushmore and you can't pick your wife? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Uh, <laughs> there's no other answer. <laughs> uh, my buddy. <laughs> You said Tom Hanks like you were about to go into like a dissertation about Tom Hanks, which you are. So I could. please go into it. Uh, a good buddy of mine was an actor, and he worked at Bubba Gump Shrimp, right? And there's posters of Tom Hanks all over the wall. And he said the ultimate thing to do uh, when there is like 10 adults and 10 kids at a big old you know party table or five adults, five kids, whatever, the way to keep the kids silent or keep them busy for the entire time is just say, who can come up with 30 Tom Hanks movies. You give them a piece of paper and a pencil, wow. and you have all the kids just sit there for an hour, come up. The fact that kids can name 30 Tom Hanks movies, children, children can do this. Uh, the fact that they can do that it says all you need to know. The guy's won back-to-back -back Oscars. He can do comedy. He can do serious. He's, he's been in everything he produces. He writes. He wrote the screenplay for That Thing You Do, which is one of my favorite music movies ever made. He wrote that screenplay. I'm going with Robert Duvall. I'm just kidding. That's fine. I mean, you, everyone can have their own thing. I just To me, there's one answer. It's Tom Hanks. I am going to go... I'm looking at either Denzel and Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. <laughs> just so that I see him, I automatically go... And when he talks loudly, he talks very loud indeed. Uh, and then uh, your musician. Prince. So you have a Jordan... Tom Hanks, Prince. You have a solid Mount Rushmore. Well, I thought uh, Michael Jordan. Oh, my bad. No, ma. Yeah. Okay. My musician. Damn. Why am I asking questions and not thinking of the answers to them? I mean, we're, we're definitely being put on the spot. And like an hour from now, I'm going to wake up and be like, oh, why didn't I, you know. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson? Yeah. It's a it's a it's a tough sell right now when people are really just hashtag canceling him after the documentaries. So, but yep. we all agree his music is un like it's the greatest yeah. back catalog of maybe any musician. Maybe Stevie Wonder. Mm, that's a good one. Uh, and then one miscellaneous, I would put myself. You're just gonna throw yourself up there because yeah. you've always wanted to be on a Rushmore. No, if you're gonna let me pick anybody, yeah, <laughs> I'm going up there next to those guys. All right, now let us uh, listen in. Again, uh, these interviews are compliments of Gatorade. Gatorade, a drink when you're tired and working out. I don't think that's their official slogan, but I don't have it in front of me. So, uh, Marcus Mariota, Sony Michelle, back to back interviews. Hope you guys enjoy them. Here are the conversations with the QB of the Titans and the running back of the Patriots. Sony Michelle, how are you, buddy? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm excited to talk to a Super Bowl champion. How does it feel to hear that, pal? It feels great. I mean, you know, kind of shows, you know, all the hard work that I put in this season with my teammates, you know, kind of paid off. So it's well deserved. Dude, I went, uh, I did a little deep dive on your IG, and I will see, man, you got some incredible quotes about hard work. Are all these yours, or are you taking them from someplace? No, I take them from someplace. I was going to say, you're the next prophet, man. I got Inky Johnson. Okay. Um, that's kind of where I get my inspiration from. I kind of, you know, daily quotes, read. And I feel like, hey, why not pass it along? And, um, you know, I just go from there. But I also see, after the Super Bowl, you, you put out a little mixtape, a little rap song, and I also saw in another photo, man, you had a whole booth set up there. Are we going to put together an album? Is the Sony Michelle LP going to be dropping anytime soon? Um, you know, 
not to not to spoil any secrets, but you know, I might have to little drop a little something. Hey. Now, Sony, I hear about a lot of NFL guys that rap. I talk to a lot of them. Melvin Ingram's talking to me about his album. We know Le'Veon Bell. I've seen Cole Beasley. Where are you slotting in amongst NFL rappers right now? <laughs> oh, man, I'm not sure. You know, I won't. I wouldn't want to consider myself, you know, a rapper. Okay. You know, just, I'm a, I'm an artist. You know? Beautiful. That's really profound. I like that. I need an artist. Uh, so the reason we have Sony Michelle is because of the Gatorade Player of the Year program. He's out there right now for the festivities, the most prestigious award in high school sports. If you want to get a take a look at it, fans go to playeroftheyear.gatorade.com. Um, I, I have a lot of young people that listen to this podcast, man. Uh, as as you've done this grind and, and you've kept going, what is something that young people can kind of put in their mindset to to let them never stop growing and never stop improving? So I, I think the biggest thing is to understand that dreams really do come true. Um, sometimes they may seem far fetched, and sometimes they may seem so close. But you know, it's all about time and being patient and working hard. Because you know, work hard and it will come. You know. And I think it's uh, this is good advice coming from a fly guy. And I'm curious. I see your brother is a fly guy. I see that you have a fly guy team. Where does fly guy come from? What age did this start? Man, this started back. I mean, I was in, I'm going to say middle school. Okay. Me and some of my friends that I grew up with, we always consider ourselves fly. And um, mm. I would say a lot of people, you know, thought the same. So we kind of... You know, create this whole, I would say, empire of fly guys. I love that. And then why are you fly guy two stacks? Fly guy two stacks because, you know, in, in high school, 2,000 yards was my goal. Love it. Man, I'm trying to get you two stacks in the NFL, man. Two stacks in the league, that's a small group. Uh, one of the guys that did get two stacks in the NFL, former Georgia Bulldog Terrell Davis. And do you guys consider Georgia running back you at this point? Oh, yeah, most definitely. You know, we will try to take that that crown, sit on the throne with that one of being RBU. I mean, lately it's been wild. You, Gurley, uh, everything from, you know, Nick Chubb. And I know you're like the biggest Nick Chubb fan ever. But if you were to pick out of the recent guys, so we're not including Sinkwich or Charlie Trippy, but if we're talking like Chubb, Gurley, Garrison Hurst, Noshawn Moreno, even Herschel Walker, who would be your top three Georgia running backs? Um, and you could include yourself, Sonny Michelle. <laughs> I'm going not including myself. Okay. Todd, uh, Nick, and um, I gotta go with the goat. So, who's the goat? Herschel, Herschel Walker. So you have Herschel one, Nick two, and who three? Todd. Todd. So do you guys all look up to Herschel like that? Is he just a guy that he walks into the room and you guys all stop and just call him the goat? Yeah, because, you know, you respect, you know, he kind of paved. I mean, there's been running backs before him. Yeah. Guys that we actually were able to watch, you know, he kind of paved that way of understanding that, hey, you know, you kind of want to grow up kind of, hey, I want to run the ball like Herschel. When you look across the sideline at the Super Bowl and there's Todd Gurley, another Georgia running back that you know really well, and you're sitting there on the sideline. Is that like a pinch me moment where you guys were sitting in the same running back room in college and you're talking about, man, one day we're going to go to the league, and now in your first year, your buddy's on the other sideline? Like, that must have been crazy. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real experience and, and it's a crazy moment same time because it's like man you, you understand how hard he worked to get to that point um obviously i i want to win the game sure um, sure he want to do the same thing but you know somebody got to come out on top but at the end of the day kind of shows just how much work he's put in did you guys have a side bet or anything because i would have had a side bet with my buddy no nah, no we had no side bet. <laughs> 
Um, what is what when you met Tom Brady and you're kind of getting to know him and all that? I, a lot of people say, you know, he's fun guy. Is he funny? Has he ever said anything to you that really made you laugh? Um, I would say so. Yeah, there's been a couple times where you know you kind of it's it's just his sense of humor. Yeah, and is it like dad humor? Like I can't even imagine what it's like. Ah oh, man, <laughs> by I mean. Probably a little bit of both, the dad humor, teammate humor. Yeah. Uh, what about Belichick? Do you, has Belichick ever told a joke in your presence ever? Yes, definitely. All right. Can you tell me a Belichick joke? Like, what's a Belichick joke? Um. See, a Belichick joke is something. It's not like nothing. You just have to catch it. Do you remember the one that you told that you were told? Nah, not off the top of my head. Man, I'm trying to get a Belichick joke. It's like my dream to get a Belichick joke. What are you? Uh, what is Gronk gonna do in his retirement, man? What is it? What is a day in the life of retired Gronk in your mind? I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm sure. You know, a lot of excitement. You know, enjoying, enjoying himself. <laughs> throughout his career, and I'm sure he's going to continue to do that. Uh, when you win a Super Bowl in your first year, it, it's got to be a crazy thought because it's you obviously know that the goal is to win a Super Bowl every year, but it's a very hard road to take to get here. Uh, what do you think the biggest lesson you took away from winning right away is? And then at the same point, how do you battle uh, kind of the relaxation that comes with success? Um, I mean... The good thing is, I've you know throughout the season I've learned um, what it takes to get to that point. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. Um, we didn't have the best season. Mm. We had pretty good games. We had you know, ups and downs, but you know, at the end of the day, we kept going and kept fighting. It took a lot for us to be able to get to the point of winning the Super Bowl. So now going into year two, it's all about resetting that focus and understand we got to go through the same things. You know. I, kn- I know that you weren't the only first-round pick for the Patriots last year, and I also know that you weren't the only Georgia Bulldog that came out last year. And I'm curious, as we start this year, and Mr. Wynn, Isaiah Wynn, your former offensive lineman, we haven't got to see him play. You did. And I look at this team and I go, man, they're getting another first round pick because Isaiah's coming back. What kind of a player are the Patriots getting that the rest of the NFL maybe doesn't know about yet? Um, a guy that's you know that's gonna that's gonna bring, I would say, you know, a good piece of this team. It's gonna help this team win a lot of football games and um he's gonna work hard. Mm. And you know, that's all you can ask from a player really. I saw uh, one other tweet, I'm going to end on this, uh, where you were kind of talking about people that were rooting against the Warriors. And you said, if you're rooting against the Warriors, I have to assume that means you're rooting against the Patriots. Which let me realize that you go, man, when you're on the, the team, everyone's rooting against you. What is that like to be the, the team that everyone's seemingly rooting against? Is it fun? I guess so. You're doing something right. You're on the team that's doing something right. And, um, you know, you're doing something right. Not many people like that. Time. All right. You, uh, you just heard from a musical artist that is also a running back from the New England Patriots. Is there a month that we should be on the lookout for some music, Sony Michelle? You just got to stay tuned. All right. What, and we're following you on social, which is going to be Fly Guy Two Stacks. Yes, sir. We are going to be tuned in. When you drop it, I'm going to play it on this podcast, and we're going to do like a nice album listening party. So I'm very excited. All right. All right, my man. Appreciate you, brother. All right. Hello. TG for honey. What up, Todd? (laughs) What's good? Man, I'm going to tell you the truth. I was texting with my man Travell Gaines earlier, and he said, now be careful. Gurley is quick. 
He's got a wit, and he's a lot funnier than you think. So I'm very excited. We had Gaines on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he was only talking good stuff about you, man. Oh. <laughs> he better be. He better be. Uh, I have something I need to admit. Uh, I went to Syracuse, and the main reason I went to Syracuse is Carmelo Anthony won the title, and I said, I want to go there. And now I'm reading that you're oh, the man. biggest Carmelo Anthony fan of all time. So I need to know more about this. I think this. something came out about that. I was like, bro, that was like a year ago. It's now people want to talk about it. Yeah, it's it funny. Like, whatever. Just off season. Have you um, have you had a chance to meet Carmelo yet? Yeah, I met him before. Okay. Was it like a fan? Like if I ever met Brian Dawkins, I'd lose my mind. Were you like, like bro now? He's the bro now. Yeah. Uh, where would you like to see him play next year if he plays? Not only no other, but uh, any Los Angeles team, honestly. I was going to say, if he comes to the Lakers and you're in the Rams, come on now. Oh, that, lit. that would be unbelievable. I'm going to um, be at the Lakers games more than I'm going to be at my game. You're <laughs> front, front row of the Lakers game, and you'll be like the only one there not in an AD or a LeBron jersey. It'll be perfect. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, I'll be the only, the only one probably. Uh, Travell was telling me you're a big time music fan, man. Who is in the rotation right now? I'm on that future right now. Um, future. Who else is out? Some artist name, No Cap. Okay. Uh, you know, any anything, Young Thug, Lil Baby, Gunna, um, Nigos, DJ Cali album, DJ Mustard album's out right now. Man, so I um. Uh, music. I just talked to your boy, Sony Michelle, another Georgia Bulldog, just tearing it up in the NFL. And I asked him, not including like Charlie Trippy and Sinkwich and the really old Georgia running backs, but from like Herschel on, who are his top three? And I'm curious, who do you think his top three was and, and what's your top three? Oh, man, don't put me on the blast like that. Now I got to think of people who went to Georgia. Um here, I'll give you the names. Sony Michelle, Terrell Davis, Nosha Moreno, Garrison Hurst, Nick Chubb, you, Herschel Walker. And you can be so on the list on, if you want. People, we're going on based on what people have done at, at, at Georgia, though, right? Uh, You can use any criteria really count, you like, want. I'm, you know how it is. Like, I mean, you know, like, like, I don't know. Um, Listen, Garrison Hurst and Nosha Moreno have pretty good careers. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, Nosha had a great career, actually. Really did. On Hoopo, too. All right, so what's it going to be? He went, I'll just tell I, you. I like Oshan. He went, um, I think he went U3, Chubb, 2, Gar- and um, Herschel Walker, 1. Yeah, I'll just put Herschel and Chubb and Sony, honestly. Oh, you guys are very nice to each other. Yeah. Well, I, I saw Sony is like a huge together, Nick Chubb. We can't, we can't support the. Well, you guys are RBU now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what is, what does Nick Chubb do so well that just makes the rest of you guys love his running style so much? He just runs. That's all he does. He just, <laughs> just runs. <laughs> run people over, run past people. Um, I can't really explain. I never could really explain his style. Mm. Like, something I ain't never seen before. But he could running. I know this Swift kid you guys got at Georgia now, man. That kid can cut on a dime. Sony's got the agility. You had the flat burner speed. And Chubb just runs. That's what he does. That's all he does. Uh, you're out there right now for the Gatorade Player of the Year program. Again, fans can go to playeroftheyear.gatorade.com. Uh, it is the most prestigious award in high school sports. Uh, advice for the next generation. I'm sure young football players come up to you. I know that you and Sony Michelle and and a few other people, you you guys do camps and stuff like that. What's your What's your best advice for young athletes trying to make it to pro one day? Uh, just keep you know keep the main thing the main thing. Keep working hard. Um, surround yourself with great people and um, just do the right thing. I mean, mm. these kids are special already, and you know, even for the kids that's not at this awards, just just keep working, even if you're not here. Because you know, I wasn't here when I was yeah. in high school, so I'm and I'm now I'm you know on the team with Gatorade, um, seeing these young athletes. So anything is possible. Just keep working. 
Uh, I saw you, that you tweeted this before you got your contract about the difference between NBA and NFL money. I went on a little rant because I understand there's more players and there's more games. I get all of that. But it's crazy to me some of the comparisons that DeAndre Hopkins is three is his contract is Andrew Wiggins is three DeAndre Hopkins and that Bro. Odell is getting paid the same as Ian Mahinmi. It just blows me away, man. I yeah, know it's crazy, right? I, I led lead in touchdowns last two years and I just seen somebody get 80 million and I couldn't even pronounce their name. <laughs> Dude, Antonio Brown, Tobias Harris got five times the amount of guaranteed money as Antonio Brown. I, I like Tobias Harris. Tobias Harris was the first guy I seen. I was like, hold on, who is this? I'm like, oh, Tobias Harris. I started looking at his game. I'm like, actually, he's all right. Oh, I Tobias he got Harris. The, 80 is... the last time, and then he just re dubbed. I'm like, hey, I ain't mad at him, man. they doing that thing. That's All we... I know is if I was in high school right now and I was 6'5, I'd be in the gym every day. <laughs> Putting work in the gym. Um, I have I have a, a left go PR. This is when I give out strategy to people. I believe that uh, you can. Everyone's talking about your fucking knee, Todd Gurley, and everybody wants to know what's up. I think you should create a social media account called Todd Gurley's Knee, and what you I can do. Want. There's already a, a, a Twitter account like that. Damn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. I, I was gonna say you could like you could tweet out you know. updates like you're the knee and be like feeling great today. Everybody, please stop yeah. asking Todd no, about yeah. me. Even if I, I mean, I mean, you, you can't win with nobody. It doesn't really even matter, honestly. Yeah, it's media is interesting, isn't it? Especially because you're in LA. I even need you though, because it's like I I found myself doing it either. You know, I mean, doing the same thing. So it's just like people. Period. You know. Uh, I'm going to be coming to your camp a little, like in a month or two, and I'm going to be doing something with Sean. I'm the one that did the thing with McVeigh last year where he remembers like every play. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, have you ever seen him forget anything before? No, I haven't. It's crazy. I don't know how you do it. It's, it's insane. I, I want to, like, I heard he knows every person's name in the building from the secretary yeah. to the janitor. Yeah, he's got like an elephant brain, bro. An elephant brain. I do love elephants. That's pretty good. Um, what about, like, is he a funny guy, too? Like, I just asked Sony if Bill Belichick okay. tells jokes. Sorry, I'm rushing. I got to go. I said I got to go. Hey, man. He's a great guy, though. Great coach. Good human being. Um, players coach. Love playing for him. Um, but his memory is it's insane. I really can't even, like, explain it. Todd, keep kicking ass, man. I appreciate your time, bro. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Take care. All right, man. All right, so that was Sony Michelle and Todd Gurley, brought to you by Gatorade Player of the Year again, playeroftheyear.gatorade.com. I'm recording this, and I'm going to keep recording this, so Jake, leave this in before we go back to me and David. Uh, again, we recorded me and David earlier in the day, about nine hours ago. It's uh, damn near 10 o'clock, and we thought we were going to get a Mariota and a, a Michelle, but we got a Michelle and a Gurley, so that's pretty funny. But listen to the two different interviews. Do you hear a guy going into his second year versus a guy going into, like, year four or five? Uh, awesome. Uh, great time talking to them. Alan, running audio, staying with here me, with me late night. I appreciate you, pal. Now let's get back to the final question of the AMA with David Ingber and myself. All right. See ya. Amazing conversations with Mariota and our man Sony Michelle. That one joke that he told. Ah, uh, great. Incredible. I mean, yes. The, we <laughs> all the things you talked about in that we I just had no to. idea when he told that second story that that happened. It was incredible. <laughs> We're doing a bit because we haven't actually heard the conversation. Yeah, yet. no, We're... I'm actually interviewing these guys at like nine forty five at night because they're on the West Coast. Yeah. So. Hopefully they're great. But yeah, that 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 anecdote he told, oh, what a gem. What a, what an anecdote. Changed my perception of him going forward. <laughs> All right, so let's end with uh, one more AMA here. Yeah, this is from Andrew Hines. Uh, great question. What was the game, journalist, athlete, etc., that made you want to pursue your current career? I know it's very complicated, but would love to hear what made the most impact. Uh, I'll go first. I think um, for me... 
it, I always knew I wanted to do something in sports. Yeah. Like I just kind of, I, I was like, do I want to be an agent? Uh, I'm not going to play, you know, how can I do this? And so for me, I used to like jokingly do play by play. Uh, I was in the varsity team for basketball. When we would travel, the girls would have to play, the JV would play, we'd have to sit there. Mm -hmm. And I would just be up in the stands being like, Oh, booger eater passes over to like whatever and puts it in. Hey. And so that's when I was like, oh, I think I can do this because mm -hmm. people would be like, do it, do it, do it. And um, there was a guy in Philadelphia, Comcast Sportsnet started in 1997. So I was 11 mm. and it was 24 seven Philadelphia sports. But like most of the hours was like the fishing network and stuff like that. But it was the only time where I was like, they're going to break down Eagles training camp today. And Michael Barkin was this the first host there, and he was openly kind of a Philadelphia fan. And it was the first time I had seen that, mm -hmm. where usually, you know, all the, and I am a journalist, and blah, blah, blah. And he was so like, and we're going to have a great year. And I was like, I love that. So that's kind of where, like, my embracing of being a fan on TV came from. Sure. Um, I would say lately I've just been studying Ernie. Ernie like, Johnson. Just because what happened is, is like I've always loved inside the NBA and I've always appreciated it. But really, I've just started to learn like how integral he is to that show. So that's been like the second development. But in terms of like really inspiring me and wanting to do this, Stuart Scott was huge. I was going to say Stu Scott. Were you, you really? took that one out of my mouth. Yeah. Or right, then you expand on Stu Scott, too. Well, he, I, I grew up as this kid that wanted to be a stand-up comic. I don't even know where I got that in my, in my brain when I was like four years old. I was like watching Premium Blend on Comedy Central, wow, you know? I love that. Maybe it was before that. But it was like comedy specials on HBO or whatever. And I was like, I want to do that. And in my mind, there was like the very serious, amazing broadcasters that I loved, like Bob Costas. Yes. And then there were the really funny people on HBO. And then Stuart Scott was like, I'm going to be just as funny as anyone else that's on TV, but I'm also going to be talking highlights the entire time. And I'm be super knowledgeable about sports. I'm going to be just so good at straddling worlds of pop culture and sports and humor and excitement and just doing it in his own way uh, that regardless, a lot of people went out there and tried to be Stuart Scott. Yes. That's not the right move. That's not what you take from Stuart Scott. No. Right? And, and this is true of anyone that's your hero. Don't try to become them. Just take what they're doing and try to make it your own. So what he was doing was being this unabashed self that we'd never seen on TV before. And that's what I wanted to do. I was like, how do I find what I want to do, distill that into my own version of, of the thing that I'm excited to bring to the world? My mom used to say that I would sit there and watch Chris Berman mm. and would go, I'm going to do that. And I think because Chris Berman and, and Stuart Scott, Stuart Scott had like phrases that he would say that just sounded so fucking cool. Yeah. And Chris Berman, when he would give a guy a nickname, I was like, it, I just, it just, it drew me in because I wanted to come up with nicknames. And I was like, how did he come up with that? And, <laughs> and he, the, these were guys that they got to ESPN at such a young age, at such a young development of that company, right. that they were able to put so much of their mark on it. And then all the people that kind of came after them had to exist in more confined lanes, but they always felt bigger than everything. And I loved that because it felt unabashedly them. Yep. And I think what you, the advice you just gave about figure out what people do I hear this from people all the time, you know, I want to I want to do what you do and stuff and it's if you don't only listen to yourself, you're just going to copy people. Right. And so it's that I think that's great advice for everybody is look at the people that you admire, study them, but then you eventually have to stop watching them or else you're only going to continue to copy their path. You need to figure out at their core, like you said, what is the reason that they resonate with you, and then stop listening to anybody. Because it doesn't matter if your favorite comedian is Dave Chappelle, or if it's Richard Pryor, or if it's Chris Rock, or if it's Dave Attell. Like, the thing that binds them all as some of the greatest comedians is that they're earnest, they're raw, yeah. they don't give a fuck, they don't take notes on their act, and they're truly original. They're truly original, and only they could do their own material because it's about their own life, their own experience. And yeah. that's the thing you should take. You shouldn't say, I want to be Dave Attell. You say, I want to do the thing that he does, but for myself. But that's why they're so special. And that's why they're so amazing. It's some, so rare. Some people are so special that they hit like Prince. 
you hit who you are so on the barrel and it's so captivating that people abandon their own dreams to help you follow yours. Mm. That you're, you've nailed it so well that people gravitate to your dream instead of their own. Yeah. That's some wild shit. But that's because none of us know why we're here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we all just want to have purpose. And really, your purpose is love. And now it's getting serious. But, Do it up, man. But just it's about it's about spending time with people that you love and that you care about, and and achieving whatever it is that fuels your fire, man. Yeah. And and don't let anyone distract you from that shit. I love it. All right. Thanks again to Mario to Michelle. Those stories are gonna go viral. Uh, Ingber, uh, man, excited to be in Lake Tahoe with you. Oh, so excited. And then as the YouTube show begins to develop more, homies. More information will more be information will become seeping available. out little pieces once at a time. I mean, I might even be doing like media tours for this kind of stuff. Nice. I'm going to have to get down like my one story. So uh, elevator pitch. My, my elevator pitch and then also the one story that I tell to all the talk shows. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, this one time? That was great. <laughs> All right, play that music, Nicholas. Uh, thank you to Audio Nick, always holding it down. Thank you to Jake for editing and putting some time codes up. Thank you to David Ingber for holding it down. Thank you, sir. We're going to be on the road, and thank you to you guys, the homies at 33%. You're the main reason we do this shit. Holla, 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 holla. We'll see you guys later.